Morning. Good morning. How are good you? Morning. Good morning. Good. Yeah. Doing good. Do you like my new backdrop? Uh, I haven't really taken it all in here, but it looks, Here's... it looks, see, the thing about your backdrop is it looks like you, you're trying too hard. <laughs> Look at mine. Look how it's just freaking just a mess. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the unmade bed with the pillow that looks like it was slept on is an indicator. That was not an intentional design. But the reason I'm here is because of, uh, we got a comment on YouTube last week. Somebody was like, David, what's with the like raggedy t-shirts and the hair that looks like you just woke up? It's nothing for us to look at on YouTube. Like you have to try a little bit. And so... um I'm like, first of all, you're right. I did just wake up and uh, it is a raggedy old t-shirt, but I could put a little bit of effort into it now that we've transitioned onto the visual medium. Maybe I should put some thought into it. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good look for sure. And I, it's funny. I mean, these zoom things, even when you're watching the news, you know, like your eyes are always brought to what's behind the person. Now this was behind me. This is my son's room. Oh, okay. The only thing I switched out is I changed out that guitar right there from a ratty acoustic to kind of a nice fender. But everything else is, this is all my son's doing. Gotcha. But it's my office because he doesn't live here anymore. Right. Well, look, the reality is listener feedback is key. It's yeah. been it's been fundamental in the direction of the show since uh, the earliest of days. And so... I read that comment. It stung a little bit because it was all true. And then I'm like, you know what? I could put a collar on and position the camera in a way that showcases uh, surf-related stuff, including our sponsors. Some NBS yeah. fins right there for you. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to discuss your books and stuff. Oh, yeah. We could do that. I well, feel like this is an important part of the show that shouldn't be missed, by the way. Okay, good. I'll include it. Yeah. Let's keep it. Um, we will start off, though, with Real Water Sports. Of course, they they make these surfboard review videos we've talked about, but last year they started an actual series called Under the Glass. They have Brett Barley as a team writer. Brett Barley had a long-term surfboard sponsor, I think for over a decade, 15 years maybe. And um, that relationship kind of you know ended, and Real goes, look, we have 1,500 boards in inventory. Why don't you just, we'll be your surfboard sponsor. Come by and grab whatever you want and then if you happen to like something we work with the shaper we can have them make a custom version for you and better yet we will document it and so that's what they've been doing they did season one last year they just launched season two yesterday and it's uh the board under discussion for episode one of season two is a channel islands two point pro versus the original CI Pro. So kind of the first iteration CI Pro, and then the second iteration is the two point pro. And Brett's testing both boards out and uh, putting them through their paces and then discussing them, of course. Well, that's cool. I'm, I'm actually, you sent me the link and I'm looking at Under the Glass with Brett Barley, season two on Real Water Sports, a dissection of uh, surfboards and their surfboard and the surfboard performance by a top level professional surfer so yeah i'm looking forward to it i was i saw the ryan sakel soap box derby was wednesday may 15th so um I'm yeah they, re they released new Ryan's. yeah of course they release new episodes weekly so um nine episodes for the next nine weeks straight and yeah the sakel is going to be the uh penultimate episode i believe second to last episode for the season finale so and pretty also, exciting. Yeah. You like that? Big, big <laughs> word. Big word. I don't know who taught me that one. Um, so go to realwatersports.com, of course, for surfboard purchasing, soft goods purchasing, anything you need for in or out of the water. But then their YouTube channel has an archive of all of the videos that they generate. And then, of course, NVS fins. You can buy them at Real Water Sports. We're bringing the Bobby quad down to El Salvador. I reached out to NVS. They're sending us not only a set of quad fins for the Bobby quad, but a variation of them to swap in, swap out. And they said, you know what? Leave them behind. Leave them at the resort for whoever comes next, just as a gift back to the community. Well, and I just received a, a set of NVS fins from uh, the boys. I got a set of 
Stu Kenson Twinsers for my new Twinser, which I'll be bringing to El Salvador. So we've got the Bobby Quad set from NVS. And um, I'm sure you'll you'll be bringing some of your favorite NVS fins as well. Yeah, for listeners who want to get in, surfnvs.com. They do, um, obviously they have a bunch of different varieties you can just pick on their website, but they do custom templates too. If you're a surfboard shaper and you just need a small run, they don't have large minimum order quantities or anything. So um, they did a single one-off set of a quad, a quad set for my john simon asymmetrical quad that i'm bringing as well so they can do stuff like that but surfnvs.com is their website as we see some movement at the takeoff zone it's kelly slater grabbing rail yeah guy yeah guy yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah guy <laughs> It's Spit, David. It's the uh, Spit Podcast. You and I talking all things surf, things that are happening in the surf world. Uh, good morning to you on this March 28th, Thursday. Good morning. That was the best. Yeah, guy. Stuttery. Thought you. Baby, baby goat. Were... That was my <laughs> attempt right, at the baby, baby goat. <laughs> that's right. The baby goat. Yeah, guy is back in full force. You must have had your drink ag1.com slash surf to get that thing out. Absolutely, ag1. Um, uh, we were, yeah, go ahead. You're, you're referencing the books that are behind me. Yeah. Perfect me segue. That. Perfect yeah. segue because a listener chimed in last week after you mentioned that, uh, that book, the children's book that you had made. Oh, and he goes, they're at the LA public library. They have oh. copies. Oh, wow. That's cool. Glad to so, know that. Yeah. So if you want to check Scott's books out, uh, look at your local library he went online and just looked through their archives and they have it in stock. Uh, there's a couple of other books, though, by A. Scott Bass. Really? They must not be me. Oh, really? I don't know. What are they? Surf. Your oh, yeah. Guide National... to longboarding, shortboarding, yeah. <laughs> tubing, aerials, hang tens, and more. Yeah. National Geographic reached out and they had me write this kind of like primer for just beginners. And... um it's rather horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my guide to tubing, which I am very interested in. Should I yeah. go should I go check the book out yeah. at the library? Yeah, if you need to learn some tips on tubing, this is the it's the penultimate book, really. There's one better. <laughs> and it has to um, do with tubing in the snow. What Oh, okay. I see. Wow. Okay. I didn't see that coming actually. Um, what is your advice? What's the guide to aerials? Where do I begin? <laughs> I'm not Scott sure what I wrote. Expert. I think I, I, I think I, I don't even remember. To, I have, I have only done one aerial in my entire life. I'm not even sure I did that. Um, I was surfing with, who was it? Uh, oh, I think it was Alex Gray. Or no, it might have been Adam Wickwire. Both of those guys witnessed it, and they said I got like a credit card error, which is when you such a small little error that you can fit a credit card between your board and the wave face. Uh, so I have no advice. Don't take my advice. If you want to learn how to do aerials, do not get that book and read up on it. And uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what I wrote, but uh, what is your advice? Give me your advice on aerials. What would you oh, tell I somebody? I did the credit card error, but the transaction got declined. That's how small <laughs> my credit card was stolen. Um, no, I have no advice either, but I've got two thoughts on your credit card error. Number one, were you attempting an error or did you just hit the lip a little too high and project? Yeah, I was definitely not attempting the error, but I was, I was trying to impress Alex Gray and Adam Wickwire. I was definitely in, I had that pride that sense of vanity where i wanted to impress and um you know they might have just been being nice to me too and saying hey man you, you did an air you know i don't know yeah it was lame regardless the whole thing was lame well because there's a version of like hitting a lip where you do uh detach from the lip like the board somebody who's watching from behind can see like oh everything came out of the water for a split second there but an air is actually weightlessness you yeah. know that version of hitting the lip and getting free isn't weightless it's just kind of pushing power through the whole thing 
but like actually hitting the lip and going weightless with the rotation is a different thing. Um, it's a different setup. It's a different landing. It's different in the middle of it, all of it. So those are two different things. But my second thought is, can we commit to trying to do an air in El Salvador? <laughs> First of all, I've never done an air. I've never been weightless. All I did was a top turn where my board came out of the wave a little bit. Um, no, I will not be committing to doing an air. It's just not how I surf. It's yeah, not no. what I do. It's not, I don't want to do it. I don't care to do it. I'm not out to, I just want to, I want to ride the wave face. That's what surfing is. If I wanted to do airs, I, I would, you know, go jump out of an airplane or something. If you s end up on a closeout and the yeah. end section is coming at you, yeah. the only other option is to kick out and you just go throw a Hail Mary. Well, can't I just do a re-entry? It's like a section that is kind of like going to smack <laughs> you down. I think I'm straightening out with a super groovy <laughs> in the flats pull out. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. The Twinser wasn't designed for an air anyways, I guess. Yeah. It would be a lost cause. Okay. The other book that was uh, authored by Scott Bass at the LA Public Library was Kayaking. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> did. I think National Geographic asked me to do that too. You just cash in checks from Nat Geo? This is when I worked. This was probably 2001, 2002. So 22 years ago. Yeah. And I was just, you know, they were putting out a series of books and they're like, hey. And so I, you know, glommed together some information and sent them something. It was, you know. It's this guy has written so many books. He forgot about them. They're, they're not, they're not books. They're just like, they're just, I don't know what they are, but you know, I love the, now, idea. the girl versus wave is a cool book. Like I actually put some thought into a theme and you know, it's a cool, cool children's book. The other two books. I don't know. Had you ever been kayaking? Prior to writing this book. I've never, no, I don't think I've ever been in a kayak. I've been in a canoe. I'm not sure I've been in a kayak. So can I paint <laughs> my own revisionist history of how this transaction went down? Yeah, it's probably closer then, to the truth. Okay, you either approve it or disapprove okay. it. Oh, yeah. um, Nat Geo's on the, on the, on a growth uh, phase. Yeah. You're riding high at Surfer Magazine. You've got a name. They're like, who's the guy? Somehow, you know, and they find you and they're like, hey, we need a couple of books. We're growing. We want to saturate. We want to fit every little category and grow in every way that we can. What do you know about kayaking? And you're like, can't be that hard. Let me do some kayak research. You know what? I'll write that book for you. And you put it together. That's pretty much an, I'll approve your, okay. uh, your history. But I think I'll add to it. They were like, this was at that time when like action sports, you know, they're like, we yeah. want to be in action sports, you know? And so they're like, can you do, you know, and they sent me an outline. They're like, here's the outline, just fill in the blanks, you Even know, better. you know, it was just like, basically it was just blah, blah, blah here. Blah, 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 you know? So yeah, that's good job. Oh, and at the time, you know, I was the online editorial director at surfer, but I also was in charge of a bunch of different websites. So I was in charge of like canoe kayaks website. The, you know, I, I wasn't the editorial guy there, but yeah. I was the, I would, those, those people were underneath me, I think on some level, but good on you for striking while the iron was hot. Um, I will say in terms of media companies that have successfully navigated the transition from print to digital, I cannot think of a better example than Nat Geo. Like they were 100% print and crushing it at, I mean, doing a phenomenal job at that. And they did a really amazing transition to where they now are. They transitioned into TV. They have their own channel, uh, amazing programming. And then transition into digital, their social media channels, their YouTube channel, all of it is very well executed, super rich with content. Beautiful marketing that goes out with every single piece. Best photographers in the world, best writers, all of it still at the top of their game. 
Yeah. <clears throat> National Geo, who's not a fan? I, I'm a big fan. Um, I actually really enjoy, and this is kind of like raise my hand, another old man moment here, but I enjoy old National Geographic magazines, <laughs> like from like the 60s or whatever, you know what I mean? Totally. Like the old ones. They're obviously super, they have a s sort of a tone of academia and uh, they're fun. They're just fun to get good insight, good information. Um, when I was a kid, my grandparents had, you know, every issue for decades, probably all lined up in one of the hallways in a built-in bookcase. It was just like a very impressive sight for a young David Scales to see all of that. And then sure enough, you pull one out and you... You feel smarter. You feel more knowledgeable. You feel more worldly after kind of thumbing through it. And uh, they were all organized chronologically. So it was just an impressive thing, you know? You know, speaking of libraries, the LA County Library, kudos to that gentleman for searching the LA County Library. I recently went down to San Diego Central Library in downtown San Diego, blown away by how pillar it was and yeah. how beautiful it was. Um, I went down there for a poetry reading, believe it or not. And yeah. um, you uh, testing the waters of poetry in case Nat Geo reaches out and they need you I, to write dude, a book. I, I've written poems. You ready I for one? You want me to lay one on you? <laughs> please, please. Okay. Do. okay. Peace will not be ours unless we unite. We must pick up the pieces and join the fight. Join together so tight. Pray the shooting ceases to end our perilous plight so that we all don't end up in a nuclear doom, death and destruction because of a few who couldn't handle living with a crippled black Jew. Wow. Yeah. Who wrote that? I wrote that. Did you schedule the burp in the middle of it? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of butchered it. I think I kind of butchered it. I wrote it when I was in high school. So that no was way. 35 years ago or something. It's still timely. I know. Kind of, kind of comes back. I mean, the best writing in the world is timeless. You know, it relates to every, all of humanity, no matter where you're at. You know what the title of that poem is? What? It's called Death by MX. MX? Yeah. I, back in the 80s, Ronald Reagan was trying to push through the MX missile. And me being a teenager with, you know, ideals, idealistic teenager, I wrote Death by MX. Wow. Yeah. Peace well, will not be ours unless we unite. First of all, oh, yeah. I didn't mean to discount you by saying who wrote that because yeah. I should know that you well, are capable after, of such greatness. After you saw my National Geo things, I don't doubt your questioning of... But you reciting it by memory yeah. may, was an indicator that you did actually, you did actually uh, create that. Yeah. Well, that was beautiful. But tell me about the books behind you. Because I see one that says Spit. There's a it's book a great, titled Spit. Great surf film from. Oh, these are was, surf films. Yeah, these are all. Yeah, these those are, are the, surf. Those aren't books. Those are surf. <laughs> oh these, you think I read books? That these speaks are, volumes right there. These are VHS surf videos, buddy. Okay. These were informative in my youth. Sorry, the glare has got this yeah. one. Um, Spit was documentation of a pipe masters event i want to say 1996 okay um witness aki's incredible comeback catch kalani's big wave savvy check out machado's career performance see the world's top pros charging in big north shore barrels so in order to watch the pipe masters you had to what buy a vhs that? What that came, that? i want to say 96 it doesn't say it doesn't say on it now because machado's thing was 2000 when this was it. copyright 1996 surf video by Mitch Kaufman. Uh, it was not Machado's year that he won. Kelly Slater won this event. Oh, that might be the this, year. Is that the year? This that is the high, high five. five. Yeah. Yeah. This the is the high five year. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> cool. Yeah. So anyways, those are surf videos back there, but right there is a book by What's one book? Justin J's H I one K. Is that Hawaii? H it's a deck. Yeah, it's a decade of um, portraits from the North Shore. Justin Jay, New York photographer. So there's actually, no reading in this book. It's, this is a picture book. 
Dude, there's captions. <laughs> captions. Look at you, poetry aficionado is now going to make fun of my. I'm not making so fun. I'm just saying what we want to see is like your most recent book that you've re that you're reading. Uh, well, I don't have a recent book that I'm reading. Um, I, do I actually eight. just joined a book club. Did you? Yeah. What's the book of the month? The Wager. And it, it was written by the same guy who wrote um what's that mo what's that book about the indians that was made into a movie um killers of the flower moon oh yeah same author the wager okay yeah uh what's it about it is about a shipwreck uh down below chile uh in the 1700s um these english sailors get aboard a man of war with a squadron of other ships and try to sail around Cape Horn to intercept a Spanish fleet and take all their gold and they get shipwrecked. And it's fascinating real life nonfiction account of what happened from what era? 1700s. Wow. Okay. So around 17, I want to say like 1720 or something like that. Well, I will make a wager of my own and say that that will too now be made into a movie off of the success of Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah, good book. And, you know, great idea. If you like a certain author, continue to read his their, his or her stuff because usually, you know, that's a good good call. Well, I'm going to be boning up on my Scott Bass books now. Oh, no, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, be so at the poetry reading, was it just to uh, support a friend or were you actually reading? You know what it was? It was, a, um, it was a fundraiser for something. Anyway, the, they called me because of the surf reports I do on NPR mm -hmm. I said, Hey, your, your surf reports, everyone knows them come down and support. And so I came down and supported. Gotcha. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, final thought on libraries and reading. Mm -hmm. I have been to more libraries in the last two years since Austin's been here than I had been for the previous 20. Yeah. And they are incredible. Like yeah. libraries are way more interesting than they were when I was a kid. Um, you know, we go to ones that are where they have like some kid exhibit or wing that's designed for them. And they are just giant aquariums. You know, it's built like Harry Potter's like a Harry Potter universe, essentially, where there's little nooks and crannies and spirals and they get to, it's just awesome. Like he actually wants to go and read. That's sweet. I love that. And yeah. I do recall, and you may re have this experience too. When I first went to UCSD, I went there sort of, I walked in as a student. I wasn't enrolled. I just walked in and said, I want to be a student. And I was just blown away by like, I'd, I'd find myself in the engineering library and I'd just be like, holy crap, like the amount of information, the level of humility that I gained by realizing I don't know anything like this is mind blowing how much information is in here on just the most random 1940s book about, you know, some sort of like mathematical equation, you know, I was just, it was just numbing how insane it was all the information that's out there. Great. And inspiring, inspiring. I mean, it's so crazy how when you're young and forced to like pick a major and go to college, let's say 18, right out of high school, you were so naive and also arrogant. You have no idea what you don't know and you don't have an appreciation for any of it. And it takes a few years because I had that same moment, but it wasn't my first two years in college. It was kind of 20, maybe 20, 21, 22, where I started to appreciate learning. Yeah. You know, and I just yep. didn't appreciate it before. And then I had exactly. kind of those experiences where I, and I think maybe travel influenced it as well. You get outside of your little bubble and you realize this is so enriching to my well being. And this is only one other little bubble. You know, the world is so much vaster than just this country in Europe that I'm going to right now. There's a bunch of countries in Europe and they're all equally interesting. Like, I need to shut my mouth open my ears and start paying closer attention. And to your point, you read a book that was written 60 years ago and it's so much smarter than I am. Like whoever was back then who had fewer resources than I have did way more work, was way more disciplined and figured way more out with far less than I have. 
I better shut up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was my experience. I basically, it kind of taught me to uh, acknowledge that the smartest thing I can say is I don't know. Yep. Yeah. That's life experience right there. Wow. Listen to us. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform that is designed for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to subscriptions. They have flexible templates with designs for every category, templates that are simple to drag and drop your artwork or logos into, but flexible enough to redesign to your specs. They have online store templates that make it easy to sell physical merchandise, digital or service products like podcast subscriptions and paywalled content. They even make customizable merch. You can design products and they will handle the production, inventory, and the shipping and handling. So let Squarespace handle it for you. They'll save you time, they'll save you money, and will save you money by going to squarespace.com slash surf. You get a free trial and you get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace.com slash surf. Enjoy. Yeah, I've got some surf news, Dave. There's the WSL at Bells Beach. We've got Survival League, for Surf Ival League. I'm still going, brother. <laughs> and, Sucker. And this, I've got some insights on the San Onofre State Beach and the word dude. <laughs> because the Olympics put out a list of words that people should know? No, I didn't oh. do that. They did do that, too. Um, yeah. We've also got listener feedback. I got an email that I'm going to read to you that uh, covers a few things. We've got a Joao Chianca update, which uh, obviously is months overdue. We've been curious about what's going on with that. I've got a must-see moment and a fact of Duke this week, which we haven't had in some time. So why don't we start with Survival League? Who did you pick for Bells? I picked Ethan Ewing. Dude. You got so lucky that he made it through. <laughs> I know everybody did because I sensed that, you know, like ninety percent of the remaining people picked Ethan Ewing. I think the judges may be in Survival League, and they picked Ethan Ewing because I watched that heat go blow for blow, and I thought George Pitar took him down. I just rewatched it again this morning, and um, you know, it it could certainly be argued. Um, I do think the first turn on Ethan Ewing's last wave was pretty spectacular. The entire wave was flowing. And I will say that I think that George was overscored on one of his waves. So anyway, it's kind of one of those things that probably if I didn't have Ethan Ewing, I wouldn't. I, it, it was, you know, too close yeah. for comfort. Agreed. Yeah, it's it's close enough to where you can't make a definitive claim that one one versus the other yeah. it kind of becomes very subjective when it's that close yeah but um look survival league the day before this event started sent out an email and they go hey we're doing the losers league again if you want to give us another 20 bucks uh you can get in with a group of losers to play for a thousand bucks and one panda surfboards as opposed to the seven thousand dollars and three panda surfboards so i gave him another 20 bucks picked ethan ewing <laughs> in the losers league and barely survived uh, by the same method that you did. But I was watching that heat and I thought, you know, obviously the, they were running round two or, or day two at Winky and it was crummy. There was a little bit of wind and George was just surfing like you do on the QS series. Like it's, you know, timing uh, these like, explosive fin free turns with the lip basically it looks very explosive and that's it's just more flashy style of surfing ethan gets up and he does that rail turn that you're talking about but it's on a mushy wave so it's very impressive very hard to do it just doesn't quite look as dynamic as the fling and flare that george patar was doing um so kind of different of style different styles but i feel like george's style is almost better suited for winky you know in that style of wave yeah, like you said, it's it's sort of, you know, nitpicking, you know, it was it's a bit of a toss up. And I could certainly see how 
especially on the back of um, Jack Robinson losing, that there was this sense of, okay, this is an event where the young bucks are going to come out. You know, Morgan Sibillic beat Jack Robinson. Crazy. And so I think there was that sense. And, and of course, on the girls' side, uh, this probably happened day one after after this event after this round but the molly picklam lost and um tyler wright lost so there's a lot of upsets so there was a sense of upsets perhaps uh you know amongst the the um, end users you and i and the people watching it but you know you gotta you gotta beat the champ uh, yeah. pretty wholeheartedly and i'm not sure he didn't and the judges took a long time dissecting it so it's not like they threw it out there quickly i mean they looked through it and they determined hey man this is our score and we're willing to back it up you know because you know we took our time looking at it well i think you might be right in that uh in that review process maybe they did identify that george was overscored on a previous wave and so when you kind of look at the heat in its totality maybe ethan edged him out by a point but when you're just watching that final exchange you know it looks like ethan maybe didn't um the cool thing that i saw on stab this morning when i was scrolling instagram was that they actually interviewed george patar and george said you know he that day his phone was blowing up with people complaining the wsl blew it the judges blew it you should have won that heat he then went back and rewatched everything online and felt that Ethan deserved to win. He acquiesced and said, no, the judges got it right. And he said that publicly on stab. So I thought that was kind of enough said, you know, and gracious of George as well. Yeah. It was very smooth and, uh, and yeah, it was, it was good. And, and, you know, look, that's sort of the beauty of the WSL and of subjective judging is that we all get to go on there and, on the internet and rant yeah you know like it as much as well, people seem to discount the wsl it's a great opportunity for everyone to kind of come together as a community and go Ugh! for everybody to watch something simultaneously and then you know comment on it and have banter back and forth about it, it is kind of fun uh the funny thing was kelly slater won his first heat in who knows how long and the world went nuts they're acting like he won the event you know, he won round one. He beat John John, which is good, but uh, he did a cool turn too. Like he surfed good, but it was like people are like, Ellie's back in form, like freaking out. It's like he won one heat. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I will say, I don't know if I've, this has been in my notes for a couple, two months, a month or two um, since the season started. I'm glad to have Sammy Poopo back. Sammy Poopo. Yeah. Dazzles me. Yeah, he's he's. It wouldn't it be fun if he was in the top five? He could you know win I mean? trestles. He, totally. he could win trestles. Yeah, for sure. But, but I mean, honestly, he could also he puts in performances at pipeline too. Like yeah. he's he's a fully well rounded surfer, and his pizzazz on you know days like they surf is really exciting. And then you put him in meteor surf, and he's got power on the rail too. So I think he's super complete. Glad to have him back on tour this year. Uh, but overall, Bell's lackluster event thus far. Today, conditions are poor. Tomorrow, small forecast. So it looks like they might run on the weekend and finish on the weekend. But when not, does, not exactly. When does that exciting. event end? Do you know when the, the last day is? I don't. I mean, the first day was the 26th, I believe, and it runs for two weeks. The waiting period's two weeks. I'm looking at the uh, forecast. This is why I ask you. And it looks like, you know, Friday, April 5th, Saturday, April 6th, Sunday, April 7th. That might be Easter weekend. Is that Easter weekend? No, Easter is early this year. It's uh, this coming Sunday. <laughs> and then Monday, April 8th, it's 8 to 10 feet with good that, conditions. That's outside the window. Their window ends April 5th, officially. They can surf April 5th. It'll be four to six feet all day. Okay. So I don't know. The rest of the waiting period, there's some spotty moments. There's a couple of days where, you know, it'll be four foot. But the next couple of days look, I guess tomorrow or the next day looks okay. Anyway, yeah, it, the, the forecast is a bit spotty until they get to April 5th. Gotcha. Well, um, while... 
were on this WCT, WSL uh, CT. Joao Chianca, we've got an update. Stab Magazine finally got an interview with Joao. Really scary stuff. Did you read this? No, fill me in. And so Joao, it is a interview with him straight from the horse's mouth. He recounts the morning uh, in the interview. They say, you know, what, what do you remember what happened? Scary thing is, is he recounts the morning pretty well up until about 30 minutes before the incident. So strangely, memory isn't cut off at the time of the injury, but it's actually erased from prior to the injury. The last thing he, he got a couple of waves that morning at pipe and back door, then broke his leash. So he went into the Volcom house, grabbed a new leash, ate, ate some food, and that's all he remembers. But if you talk to his camp and watch the video, he paddles back out and gets more waves, you know, like got a couple of sick barrels before the actual incident happened. So it's really scary that memory can erase like that. Um, but interestingly, we all saw the wipeout that we thought the injury happened on. That wasn't the injury. He was paddling back out and it happened after that. He duck dove a, like he got wiped out on the first wave at back door. So a set was behind it. So he scrambles to his board, has to duck dive the first wave, you know, is able to do that without any trauma. And then the second wave landed on him. And that's where the incident happened. And he, of course, doesn't know what happened, but he had a cut on the back of his head that required 14 stitches, a lot of brain bleeding, a fracture on the right side of his head. So the doctors presume, of course, that he hit the bottom. His board had no damage to it. So he didn't hit his board, but he hit something enough, hard enough to crack his skull, basically. Um, his first memories after the incident were four days after the incident. So obviously we all saw the footage where they got him to the beach. Pe people rescued him, got him to the beach. They took him to the hospital. Um, he doesn't remember anything for four days. Then he spent two weeks in the hospital and then two additional weeks in rehab. Interestingly, throughout the recovery, he couldn't feel his left foot. And his left foot had no damage, you know, no visible damage, but it was probably nerve related from the brain injury to where he couldn't feel his foot. So he's been in rehab ever since. He said his goal is, uh, or he's been rehabbing ever since down in Brazil. And his goal is to be fully up and running, surfing at a high level back at the Olympics. So he also recognized that is an ambitious goal and that it's one day at a time. And each day is uh, complicated by new challenges that, you know, you overcame some challenges yesterday, but the next day presents things that you didn't anticipate. So he's aware of that and taking each day as it comes, but he has been surfing again. He's getting it back. He's, re you know, recovered the feeling that he lost in his left foot and the Olympics is what he has his goal set on. Yeah, that seems like a pretty optimistic timeline based on what you told me um, for him to you know, be ready for the Olympics in probably late July and early August. That seems, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I hope he does it. I hope he pulls it off. I'm sure he will. The guy's a, he's a, he's a beast, you know, um, mm -hmm. and he's young enough to, to, to bounce back. And um, I hope he makes it. Of course, if he doesn't, it's interesting, right? Who does, who fills his spot? Uh, obviously maybe. a Brazilian. Yago, maybe? Maybe. I, I mean, we've already got Felipe, I think Yago, and then Gabe won his spot in uh, through the ISA thing. Yeah. Interestingly, there's one quote that I want to read to you from Joao, because I think it's pretty, um, it's an interesting point of discussion, but he says, quote, I don't just want to be the same surfer that I was. I don't even feel like the same person anymore. Injury teaches us so much. It teaches us to be patient and to face things that are hard to understand, things that we don't have any control over, but that, uh, but that are meant to happen. I want to go past the level of surfing that I was at before my incident, and I have a long way to go, but it's an exciting journey for me. So I think it's an interesting kind of, uh, I mean, brain injury is unpredictable, so who knows what actual limitations that will create on your body's functioning. But beyond that, the idea of having kind of a life altering incident and then becoming a totally different version of yourself 
is I think compelling and, and actually, um, true, you know, like we were talking about earlier, you're just, when you're young, you're just, it's all brash and bravado and, but there's a deeper layer after that. And it sounds like beyond maturity, there's also life-changing incidents that can kind of spur and spark something like that. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting quote that he throws out there and it, it, it speaks to, uh, a level of maturity that's welcome. And, um, and I think that's something maybe that happens when you get a life altering injury is you have a lot of time to think about your place in the world. Really? I mean, time is interesting, right? Because for somebody at his level, he never had a chance to slow down and process what things are, what's even going on. You're just moving so fast throughout the world when you're traveling, trying to qualify for the tour and making money and all that. So introspection is um interesting can do interesting things but look mick fanning ripped his hamstring off the bone um doing a floater mid-career and people called that a light you know a career-ending injury and he came back and won world titles after the fact so it wouldn't be the first time that it's happened obviously that is not a brain injury and we don't know much about brain injuries still as humans so it's a different thing entirely but similar in certain ways. Yeah. I mean, as a surf fan, it's been, an, I've missed Jao. you know, he was such a wild card. He was such a, an aggressive, um, nonstop, you know, I think competitor and you draw Jao, you're frigging bombed. Cause this guy brings 130% at every single heat. And he's just, he's just uh, tenacious, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. And in all conditions. So thank you for the update, Joao and Stab Magazine for putting that together. And we're wishing nothing but the best, of course. And uh, hopefully we'll see him at the Olympics. Spot that he earned. Yeah, for sure. Factormeals.com slash surf 50. Let me tell you, Factor Meals has filled a specific gap in our lives that has simplified our busy schedules and satisfied and nourished us. If you follow me on social media, you know that I love to cook. My wife and I love food and wine, but there are still at least five meals a week where we're just underprepared, short on time, and don't want to make a bad dietary decision, nor sacrifice the pleasure that we get out of dining. Factor has solved it. Chef prepared meals that are delivered to your house weekly. They take two minutes to heat up and they're designed to be eaten anywhere. There's no prep, no cooking, and you can recycle the package that it comes in. Delicious meals that are good for you with over 35 options to choose from each week. Go to factormeals.com slash surf50. Less expensive than dining out, more delicious, more nutritious. Factormeals.com slash surf50. Well, um, if I can, I'll give you a little bit of insight about San Onofre. I don't know if this is going to bore our listeners or not, but I've grabbed some stuff as a primer before I tell you what's happening there. Um, and uh, I'll just read a little bit if you don't mind. Okay. San Onofre, this is from Matt Warshaw's Encyclopedia of Surfing. Relaxed tradition soaked Southern California surf break at the northern end of San Diego County, adjacent to San Clemente, home to the Pacific Coast Surf Riding Championships from 38 to 1941. And the area regarded since the end of World War II as a friendly surfing sanctuary for families, beginning surfers, and old timers. After World War II, with the development of shorter, lighter surfboards, performance-minded California riders began looking for more challenging waves at places like Malibu and Wind and Sea. San Onofre, along with hundreds of square miles of inland property had meanwhile been turned over to the United States Marines. When it looked as if the Marines would shut San Onofre down to surfers, Orange County surfer slash dentist Barney Wilkes led the drive in 1952 to establish the San Onofre Surfing Club, whose members were allowed beach access. By the early 1960s, San Onofre was enshrined as a warm, nostalgic, easygoing, family-style surf break. And club membership, and club members, excuse me, were singularly devoted to their beach. By 1965, David, there were 800 club members 
including Los Angeles Times publisher Otis Chandler and Gunsmoke star James Arness. And there were another 500 on the waiting list to get in. In 1973, San Onofre became part of the California State Park System, was open to the public, and five years earlier, the break lost a measure of its wilderness cachet with the opening of the looming, looming twin reactor San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. But otherwise, the marine-operated area remained almost completely underdeveloped. Now, the reason I bring this up, David, is that the lease on the San Onofre beach access that the state now has with the United States Navy is up in August. Since basically the Nixon administration, the California State Parks has been paying $1 a year to lease that land and to give us, the general public, access to the Navy's land. This is the Navy's land. And they own the land, as I mentioned, basically from Cottons all the way down through all of the trails access and inland like 180 miles. Wow. So now there's been some negotiations. They're trying to negotiate, you know, to renew the lease. It's not going to be at $1 a year. Those days are over. And, you know, experts are saying, look, granting access just to the beach strip there is worth millions of dollars a year. Now, um, the negotiations are ongoing. Nobody really knows what's happening with it. It's the state parks negotiating with the Navy and, of course, the San Onofre Foundation, which is led by Steve Long, who's a former state parks uh, captain there at San Onofre, is a uh, part of these negotiations, I believe. Um, but it's kind of up in the air and it all <clears throat> at least ends in August. And because it's been so hush hush, there are some concerns. By the way, this means access, as I said, to lowers, to uppers. Yeah. Um, my sense is, is that the Navy's going to grant access. But because it's been rather hush hush, people are a bit concerned and we will see what happens. I mean, three scenarios would be. They block off access and keep it as their own. Number two would be they continue it as it is, but just negotiate a new price, basically. Uh, in which case, they may have to charge for people to come to the beach. You got to pay 20 bucks to go surf lowers or something. Um, and then the third option would be sell it off to developers, right? Which feels like would never happen. That's the least likely of the three options, right? Yeah, I don't think I, I, that one seems pretty far fetched. I think the Navy would just keep the land. Okay. Um, but the idea of like, how much is it going to cost to access the beach? Don't we have, see, because it's Navy land, it's federal land, it's not state land. It's um, how much of the state mandate that we have access to the beach is legal like i don't i think we there's we have no authority there they couldn't mm -hmm. just go nope and just nix it and then of course they'd have to do what they did back in the 70s which is basically have marines military police kind of roam the beach and kick people off kick surfers off basically i just I don't think, think they don't i don't think they have the that's just they don't i don't yeah i don't think the they want to do that the genie's out of the bottle already it'd yeah. be way too hard to block access entirely but i could imagine a scenario where you know, it's like the national parks where you go to Yosemite and you have to pay. There's a gate and you have to pay to get in there. Yeah. And so I could easily see that, which to be honest, I'm okay with. It is what it is. And it does cost money to maintain those things and to do, you know. Yeah. So and as many of you know, the beach there, the road, the access to San Onofre proper has been destroyed by the rains, and they're in the process of fixing that road. And I wonder if some of that has, um, I'm sure it has some effect on the negotiations. Like how much is this costing us? How much are we, are we going to have to do this every time it rains? What's the deal? If we do this, let's do it right this time. And so let's build, you know, maybe they're going to build out, you know, yeah, like legit infrastructure rather than just 
grind out another dirt road. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, <clears throat> yeah. everything's changing. Anyway, I hope I didn't bore readers too much. It's an important By the way, one, mo- one other quick thing I'll tell you about, um, which may or may not interest people. But like all industrial sites, the San Onofre nuclear power plant has permits to discharge operational wastewater into the ocean. These discharges include non-radiological and radiological releases. The non-radiological releases, such as sewage, meet the stringent criteria as implemented by the state of California. Now, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they govern the radiological releases. In both cases, the wastewater, be it radiological or non-radiological, is cleaned up and highly diluted before released to the ocean via discharge ports that are more than a mile offshore from San Onofre. So this discharge water is put in a tank. It goes through filters, through ion exchangers to remove impurities. And then it's released. These releases are, the public is notified of these releases 48 hours in advance. And these releases are similar to those that have been performed in the past and continue to meet all the regulatory requirements. The last release happened about two weeks ago. Mm. And um, basically you have to subscribe to the release newsletter to find out when the releases occur. And um, again, these releases occur about 8,000 feet out into the ocean off of San Onofre. And uh, there you go. There's some insight on what happens with that. Scary. Stay away. Stay away is what I say. Radiological shark attacks. (laughs) Sharks with freaking laser beams on their foreheads. Sharknado. (laughs) Um, We've got a listener uh, pushback. Listener email pushback. Would you like Uh to hear what the listeners are saying? Uh Uh-oh. Says, hey, David and Scott, I hear a couple of things really frequently on your podcast and other surf-related media and want to offer an alternate opinion on them. I'm a longtime surfer in my 60s from the Sunshine Coast, Australia. So all of my comments relate to riding waves in the one to eight foot range only, which, which is what most of us do anyways. Number one, volume is your friend. I think this statement is a fundamental falsehood, although almost always said as factual statement. I think the opposite is actually more correct. The less volume a surfboard has, the better it'll generally ride waves. As surfer, as a surfer improves, they should be looking to decrease board volume, not increase it. I think increased volume only makes paddling and catching waves easier, not riding of waves. And of course, this is where the stoke comes from. I know we aren't all pro surfers, but that shouldn't matter. All of uh All of us would benefit from downsizing. For reference, I'm 70 kgs, which is about 155 pounds, and never ride over 25 liters. Do you think that this theory makes sense? Point number two, quiver size. People are always talking about the different boards and their quivers and how they want to fill a gap they might have. I think the perfect quiver size is one. I have one board that I ride in all conditions and never even think about an alternative. If you have a good everyday board you are familiar with writing, then it would go fine in hollow and fat waves and probably still be fine in six to eight foot and serviceable in one foot dribble when you are probably just only going in to get wet anyways. I see surfers turn up with a groveler all the time and find the swell has jumped unexpectedly overnight and they regret that they don't have their normal board. I don't think it is a conspiracy by the surfboard industry to encourage surfers to buy more surfboards, to have a large quiver, more just that surfers can't help themselves. Insert Scott's name here. And love the feel of a new board and want to surf like Machado was surfing in that last video where he was demoing a funky new model that probably wouldn't work for the average surfer anyways. Anyways, just a possible alternative view to some commonly held possible misconceptions, question mark. Thanks, Dale. Dale coming in hot. Well, those are some interesting viewpoints. Um, I think that it just depends on your outlook. If you think that foam is not your friend because you 
because when you're actually riding the wave, less foam means more performance. But it just depends on the wave. You know, like he said, grovelly, like if it's one foot, you kind of want a longboard or a foil. You're going to get more out of a crappy one foot wave. You're not going to be able to do a turn on a six foot trifin. At least I'm not. If it's four feet, okay, yeah, I don't want a longboard. I want, I want a ripper model, whatever that might be, whatever yeah. I feel like makes sense. And so a lot, that lot flies of his comments, in the face. that flies in the face of his second point about the quiver size. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it's all just so subjective. Like, okay, just get one board. I don't give a shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm not going to argue with you. Go for it. I personally like, it's fun to have different boards to ride and to feel the, the way that they ride and to experience the, the, different characteristics of the designs and i enjoy that and and if you like one board more power to you go go get it I, i'm not i'm not going to try to convince i don't even care see i'm here to argue so i will try to convince okay. uh, i think that he's correct you know a Wrong. lesser well a lesser volume surfboard will allow better surfers to maneuver a surfboard more precisely that's true. However, the whole foam is your friend concept has evolved out of a collective kind of agreement that you aren't as good as you actually think that you are. So yeah, if you are a pro surfer, you need lesser volume will allow you to surf precisely and do exactly what you want to do with less, you know, but if you're a pro surfer, you don't need Dale or Scott to tell you that. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying is everybody that falls below the category of pro surfer overestimates their ability and does downsize because they see what the pros are doing. And then Dale's point is riding the wave is where the stoke happens. But the point is you won't even catch the wave once you downsize in foam. So in order to catch the, he's right. More foam helps you paddle easier and catch more waves. That's the fun part is catching more waves. And then once you're up and riding, the point is still salient that foam is your friend because you're not as good as you think you are. You think you're going vert at 12 o'clock, check the footage. You barely hit nine o'clock. You know what I mean? And, and a foamy, a fuller surfboard will still allow you to get to nine o'clock. And so I think that is where the argument really lies. And maybe Dale is going vert at 12 o'clock and he does need to be riding a 25 liter board. That is the perfect board for him. I can't speak to that, but for 95% of other surfers, they overestimate their abilities. It sounds like there's a lot of people with a lot of foam surfing around Dale and catching all Dale's <laughs> waves. <laughs> I don't know. God bless I, Dale. I'm stoked. He's riding a short board and ripping. I, I do sense that. Um, I'll tell you what, if you go on YouTube and you just watch some of these raw video clips, like sometimes you'll see like raw day at North Point or raw day at, you know, Joe Blow's beach break or whatever. Just yeah. watch the average surfer. Oh, yeah. They all suck. They surf like I do. They do a bottom turn. All we're doing is bottom turns. I guarantee you. If you're a getting to of... nine o'clock, I'll be stoked if I get to nine o'clock. Totally. And a lot of them aren't even getting to the bottom turn. They are paddling frantically trying to get to their feet and then wiggling around you know not not driving the board at all and it's largely bars that are way too small for that level of surfer um but dale i love dale's mentality of a one board quiver like i think that that's actually a healthier place to be is just Live a minimalist lifestyle. It applies beyond surfing, but live a minimalist lifestyle. Because once you open the Pandora's box of like, you know what? What's the number? What's the number where you've gone we, too far? You and I have board ownership. Well, you and I have dissected this before and we landed on three. Yeah. Three is the right number of surfboards. Yeah. Um, you, there's, you could pick three different boards that have enough versatility within them that they kind of cover the full range. But once you open Pandora's box you can never fully fill the box. You know what I mean? Like there's always a little slot that you could fill. It's not and a so box. It's a huge storage container. <laughs> how many storage containers? Oh man. I don't know. I can't it, say I'm embarrassed. Exactly. Once you open the storage container, there's endless storage containers. Um, but that's a fool's errand, you know, and you never 
being happy with what you have is, and Dale's kind of right. Like, you know, to our points is you're never going to be surfing those boards to their fullest potentials either. So just take the one board out and just go get wet. If it's one foot, go get wet and just have a good time. If it's 10 feet and push yourself and try to have a good time and you still won't fulfill your potential, yeah. you know, maybe on a four foot day, you actually execute and that happens once a year, but everything else is just going out there to learn, to get exercise, to get wet, to get cleansed. And that's it. Yeah. I, and I agree with Dale on some level as well, because I, we've all been in that place where, or at least I can't speak for everyone, but I know I have been in a place where I've had a board and I've ridden the board for a while. And I'm like, you know what? I could ride this board for the rest of my life and mm -hmm. be good. Like this board's kind of the perfect board for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, problem is we get caught up perhaps in our own van. I get caught up in my own vanity or my own desire to, like he said, surf like Rob Machado. And, um, and the other thing is if there's a three board quiver is the perfect number of boards. What I end up doing is uh, those are basically categories. So there's like a board for this type of wave and there's a board for this type of wave and there's a board for this type of wave. So within those categories, I end up like riding a board and going, Oh, but maybe if I did this and got this design, it would be better for this category. So I have like four or five boards for each category, which is, yeah, which is where the problem is. Totally. Well, the other problem is you and I are interviewing surfboard shapers all the time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I have two boards. No, I have one board coming. And I mean, frankly, you know, like I'll look on, I'll look on map by all, I'll look on the lost website and be like, Holy shit that board looks sick, you know, and I'll go on to, I'll, I'll walk into Hanson's and I'll see so many boards that look unbelievably great. I'll find a Xanadu and I'll be like, Oh my, or a Larry Mayville twins or I'll be, Oh, I need, I need to get one. You know, <laughs> there's so many cool boards. The boards are just cool. Yep. We've got an addiction and that is for sure. Um, well, I've got, a oh, follow up real quickly on we voted on surfboards last week to bring to El Salvador. Hold on for just a sec. Let me okay, go for it. Rocketmoney.com slash surf. Just this week, my wife figured out she was paying a subscription for Showtime, but then also paying for Paramount Plus, which includes Showtime for free. That's precisely what Rocket Money was designed for. A modern tool that meticulously tracks the details that we easily get distracted from. It's a finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your monthly spending, and helps you lower your bills. It gives you freedom by helping you see your subscriptions in a simple dashboard and alerts you about hidden fees or increases. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash surf. Calm the clutter in your head, simplify the tedium of your financial life, and find freedom through rocketmoney.com slash surf. Last week, we voted on the board to bring to El Salvador. Our guests for the trip chimed in. We're bringing a Bobby Quad. Um, NVS is going to send us a fins for the board and additional fins. And then I reached out to Christian at Trees Wax. He's sending wax for the entire group. Oh, killer. Unreal. 40, 40 bars of Trees Wax. Nice. That's incredible. So That's... thank you. Thank you. Christian treeswax.com. Who's, who's bringing that down? <laughs> it's only seven pounds actually. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll take care of that. Scott, don't you worry. You're I'm a little hard about it. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so treeswax petroleum free surf wax, they sponsor must see moment. My must see moment by treeswax. I was prepping for an interview with, uh, Patrick Treffs. Yes. Photographer, filmmaker. And I came across his film, it's about eight years old. It's called Surfer's Blood. Rad. It's available on redbull.com, but I'll post it with today's show notes. Uh, man, oh man, it's epic. It is uh, basically mini documentaries on individual surfers, but deep dives. And, um, you know, Flea is in it. Uh, Bob Pearson is in it. One interview that I just really love, somebody that I hadn't really 
I don't know, uh, learned about. I had seen him kind of in the periphery of the surf world, but I didn't know about uh, that well was Thomas Meyerhofer, surfboard designer. I mean, he's a designer and then um, also surfs and designs some really interesting surfboards, the slip in uh, Thomas Meyerhofer. So they do a deep dive with him, but the film is fantastic and beautiful filmmaking, but the intimate detailed, deep portraiture of these people in the surf world and on the periphery of the surf world, Steve Coletta was, I think the closing interview or closing profile feature in the film, yeah. um, was epic. And so, man, if you like surfers and surf personalities and kind of, you know, all, through the podcast interviews that you and I do, we try to do deep dives and get to know people's personality. This was that, but uh, with visuals attached to it too. So Surfer's Blood by Patrick Trevs. Well, I'm going to check that out. I'm a huge fan of Patrick Trevs. Um, he's so cool, right? Yeah. He's always been a super good guy and, uh, and a very interesting guy. And uh, has a certain aesthetic that I think comes through in his photography and everything he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> Speaking of surfer's blood, did you see Nathan Florence gashed his eye open at Pipeline yesterday? No, I didn't. Yeah. Um, there's some pretty massive pictures here from his YouTube account. Mm. Uh, like just next to his eyeball right here. Pretty solid little cut. Looks like it's going to take a couple stitches, but I mean, it's so close to uh face to reef he said nine stitches nine stitches but the nose and the eyes are all good some nice waves before this happened to me i'll be healing up that's what he wrote solid hmm. swell so there's been a lot of late season west swells at pipeline like why he's been getting some good surf totally man nathan happens to the best of us huh if nathan yeah. can't avoid it neither can you well, pipeline's just such a gnarly wave, especially the backdoor section. Whew. Yeah. Um, my Duke of the week. We haven't had a Duke or a kook for a long time, but my Duke is Surfline posted an Instagram clip and it was a PSA for where not to paddle. And it shows Will Scudin taking off on a perfect left, pulling into the tube and there's somebody paddling out. And they're paddling, of course, for the channel slash shoulder of the wave until he sees Will scoot and pull in and he's, you know, driving through the barrel. The paddler then goes the opposite way, cuts the opposite way into the impact zone because he knows that he will block Will scoot line in the barrel if he tries to go paddle and do a duck dive and not get smashed. And so puts himself into peril by going into the impact zone, but thereby giving Will Scooten a clean line to make the barrel. And it was perfect. It was like, this is certainly exactly how you're supposed to paddle, but bravo to Surfline for publishing the video and making that the highlight of the video, as opposed to just the barrel itself, but making a PSA for new surfers who don't know the rules. Well, it was a really good um bit that they put out there a little psa as you say a public service announcement about the proper way paddle into the impact zone never paddle for the shoulder the funny thing about all of these rules and that's a good rule by the way is like if you go to rincon there's like a huge sign that says do the opposite they're like paddle to the shoulder never paddle into the, where the surfer is yeah. so there's never it's really each situation demands that you understand how fast the surfer is going relative to where you're going to end up when you guys vector you know what yeah. i mean and sometimes in fact in that clip they showed you he almost paddled right into will scooten it was very very close it almost seemed like he did the wrong thing yeah sometimes the right thing to do is just sit there and because the surfer if you're static the surfer is going to be good enough usually to go okay I, that guy's a static element i'm going to just be able to surf around with this you know this static situation uh, if you got a, two guys that are moving now you've got more involved in um you know sort of <laughs> You're doing complicated, you're, you're yeah. doing complicated math while you're standing on the surfboard. Yeah. Um, but that guy did make the right call, but the problem is he made the right call too late. And so it put him almost, you know, in a bad situation. But as soon as he figured out that he needed to move is when he started moving and he moved just fast enough to get to a yeah. part where he uh wasn't going to create conflict, but the impulse is, of course, to put yourself in safety. And that's why people, and that's why the sign at Rincon says that. And that's generally the right move is 
paddle for the shoulder unless there's a surfer who needs that line. And that is where people need to understand you put yourself in peril before you put the other surfer in peril because he's the one or she is the one up and riding the wave. So they get priority in that scenario. I think but, the general rule of thumb is don't move at all. If if you feel like you're, if you moving towards the shoulder, if you can't assess, yeah, imperils the ride at all. Don't move, and or paddle the opposite way of the that the guy's going. Go the yeah. opposite way. Never go towards where the guy's going. Uh, the that problem never, that never happens. The problem with new surfers, inexperienced surfers, I should say, is um, they're probably judging that surfer by how fast they surf. So they see Will Scooten is so far away and they're just like, there's no way he's going to make it all the way to where I'm at. I'm paddling for the shoulder, but they underestimate how fast professional surfers surf and how fast you move in the barrel, you know? And so they end up creating conflict unknowingly just I got a simply by ignorance. That, that relates to this. Say you're riding the wave and there's like four or five guys out on the, you know, paddling out and many of them are skating towards the shoulder and you run one of them over. Whose fault is it? Uh, there's too much that wasn't said in that scenario for me to <laughs> fully define, but I'm saying if it's me up and riding, I'm going to say it's their fault. Um, Cause I have a certain level of competency that I know, you know, I, I didn't accidentally, uh, you know, I didn't run them over. I couldn't avoid, but run them over. And in that case, they put themselves in harm's way, but there's, I see a lot of kooky people standing up on a wave that easily could have avoided the surfer. And then they don't. And that is shared fault. Yeah. I mean, my, my sense is that 99% of the time it's the guy paddling out's fault. If they would just sit up and be static or paddle the opposite way, they wouldn't be in harm's way. Yeah. And usually if it's like you or me or any competent surfer, we're riding the wave and I'm, and I'm telling myself, look, there's four or five guys. If they're smart, they'd be paddling away from me, not at me. Totally. The, the problem is like you said, with Rincon where it's so crowded, it's just a free for all. Like everybody's paddling for the shoulder. There's a hundred people paddling for the shoulder over the course of your length of ride. And so because they're all doing it wrong, nobody is now held accountable. Well, you know, like for sure, if, if somebody, if I accidentally run somebody over, um, it's horrible and nobody wants that to happen, but I'm generally not at fault. Like my, yeah. my, I guess my pride or my, my gut instinct here is that, dude, what are you doing? Yeah paddle away from me, you know? And yep. I don't know, maybe, maybe that comment's going to catch some, uh, maybe we're going to get some phone calls on that. No, comment. but I, I agree with you. Cause even at Rencon, if I'm paddling out and there's a surfer on a wave and I see, you know, the whole crowd of a hundred people around me are paddling towards the shoulder. I'm following the crowd up until the moment where I see, oh no, like I am going to be run over by the surfer. In that case, I would paddle the opposite direction of the crowd, but there is some sort of a, um, protection that the crowd gives you or just a, you know, a shared, I don't know what the word is. Like a social, <laughs> yeah. Or like, look, we're as a, as a unit, a hundred of us are moving this direction. That surfer has to navigate this crowd. Like that's kind of on them. Yeah. Um, so in that moment, it's a little bit different, but I still agree with what you're saying in that 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, the paddler is responsible if they get run over. They yeah. could have chosen something different that would have gotten them out of that situation. And ultimately, they're responsible for their own well-being. Like, you're the one who's going to get injured. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you need to be responsible. If you're a pedestrian on the road, your head needs to be on a swivel. Even if you have a green cross light, don't be looking at your phone. Check everywhere. Make sure because you're the one who's going to get hit by the car. And the driver may legally be at fault but you're the one who's going to be maimed by this scenario. So check yourself. By the way, the, you the, California, the California uh, legal system, you and I spoke about this a couple of episodes ago. Uh, there's no liability. Like if that happens, it's just an yeah. accident. Good. I like it. Okay. Well, look, 
David, we've said a lot. We've had a big show. Uh, until next time, adios and aloha. All right, Scott, colbyplus.com for premium Yamamoto rubber. I was on their website yesterday. I was looking at the 4.3, hooded 4.3, and I saw a review from one of our listeners. I recognized his name. Oh, cool. And he, yeah, he said, quote, Colby Plus wetsuits are bar none the best wetsuits I have ever owned. Bar none. The Yamamoto is so buttery and warm which is what I need up here in the PNW, Pacific Northwest. In the past year, I have now accumulated three Colby Plus wetsuits, a 3-2, a 4-3, and now the 4-3 hooded. So stoked on these wetties. Four exclamation points. That's cool. And you know, the, we just had a big system of wind move through here in Southern California. And man, did it get cold. The upwelling just brought some 56-degree water right up into uh, the surf line. And I, when I reach for my suit, I've got, you know, two or three different options and the warmest one. And by the way, as flexible, if not more flexible than the other ones is the Colby plus. And so that's yeah. the one I reach for because I'm like, I need to be toasty. I need to be buttery and uh, Colby plus they, they take care of that. No problem. I love yeah. it. Big fans. And also the best fit for me personally, I don't struggle to get in and out of it or anything like that. Once it's on, it just, it fits snug like it was tailored. So Colby is spelled C-O-L-B-Y plus P-L-U-S dot com. All right. Thank you, Scott. Okay, bud. Talk See you next week. week. Okay. Bye. Bye.